Okay, so welcome everyone to the Swiss Startup Conference 2021. My name is Adam. I am the founder of Startup Network Europe, and it's amazing to see 700 people connected right now, and the number is going up every second. Um, so folks, uh, before I begin this event, I just want to say most of you are in Switzerland, you are founders, um, but we also have many investors and other people from the United States and other countries. So I thought it would be good to give a very quick uh, introduction to the Swiss startup scene. Um, so there's a great uh, website called dealroom.co. They do an analysis of startups all over the world. And according to them in Switzerland, uh, there are nearly 5,000 verified startups in their system. And if you look below, the growth is crazy. It's gone from uh, very few startups, maybe 100 or 200 million euro in funding in 2010 uh, to well over 2 billion in funding in the year to date in 2021. Um, so we're looking at potentially 10 times more growth in just 10 years. And Switzerland, as we know, also has many investors, many corporates. And uh, year by year, even day by day, we see more startups uh, being created. Uh, some of the superstar uh, unicorn startups in Switzerland um, include Actelion Pharmaceuticals, uh, Sport Radar and Veam. Um, and Switzerland, why set up a startup there? Well, really, there's many reasons, but one reason is it has been called one of the best places uh, to set up a business in Europe. It has a very accommodating business environment, a world-class labor force, and you pay for what you get. Switzerland, of course, has a reputation for being expensive, but as a result of that, it has some of the best educated people in the world, some of the best engineers, software developers in the world as well. And Switzerland, because it's in Central Europe, beside Germany, Austria, Italy, so many countries, um, it has a great access to international markets. Um, it also has a fantastic world-class uh, transport and digital infrastructure. And it speaks four different languages uh, nationally. Um, and also lots of people speak English in Switzerland. The main ling language, language is German, followed by uh, French as the second language. Um, and then in terms of today, the plan is very, very simple. Uh, it's going to be a two-hour event. Uh, with 36 different speakers and that'll start with the Swiss Startup Leader section. So we're going to have Raphael, President of the Swiss Startup Association, then Olivia from uh, Swiss Healthcare Startups and Nicholas from Digital Switzerland and Marcel uh, from InnoSuisse Swiss Innovation Agency. Then we will have a Silicon Alps section where we have 22 speakers who are mostly uh, Swiss founders based in Switzerland. Then we will have a Silicon Valley section, which is Swiss entrepreneurs based in the United States. And then we will have three fireside chats throughout the event. And these are basically 10 minute conversations about customer engagement, about HR, about outsourcing. So very valuable tips for startups here. And then if we have time, we will also have a Q&A. As the president of the Swiss Startup Association, the umbrella organization here in, in Switzerland. And the general question is always, okay, why an association is needed? And overall, we can say, as you already mentioned before, Switzerland is an amazing place um, to found your own startup. A lot of founders are here, a lot of organizations are here. You, you know this already, so there needs an organization to make sure this will be in the future as well, to have more startups here in Switzerland and to have even better startups in Switzerland. And in this case, there is a, an association needed who takes care of this. Mostly of them are political topics. And um, as a startup founder, everyone here is a, is a founder, he knows. Uh, it needs a lot of time to work on political topics, but someone has to do it um, to make sure that it will better conditions in one or two or even 10 years. And uh, when they're doing some decisions, our guys in the capital city and they will decide something it's always important that there is a voice who talks for who speaks for the startups and in this case we are or that's the role of the swiss startup association to make sure when someone something will be decided that the startups will not be forgotten in this um, decision and of course there are some operational tasks as well some coordination uh, functions between the different startup organizations here in uh, switzerland and um, between um, the different um, branch organizations like uh, Swiss healthcare startups, for example, or Digital Switzerland. It's always good when there is a coordination function between these different um, organizations. In this case, 
for the startup founders here in in in, uh, in, in the discussion now. And you will see a lot of benefits on our platform. Most of them, they are for free. Uh, you can use it. You have some investor lists, investor fact sheets, stuff like this. And of course, we are always try to make it better and easier for startups. So in this case, most of them, most of the stuff is for free. And uh, I hope you can benefit um, not only from this uh, session today and then as well benefit from our tools that we provide on our platform for the Swiss uh, startup ecosystem. So in this case, thank you very much. Yeah, Raphael, thank you. So next up, we have Olivia, a CEO of Swiss Healthcare Startups, a nonprofit organization that supports innovative startups that aim to add value to the Swiss healthcare ecosystem. Uh, Olivia speaks five languages, and she leverages her commercial experience and legal and business background to contribute to advancements in healthcare. Here we go. Thank you so much, Adam, for the introduction and wonderful how many people came together today. We're over 900. Cool. So um, a question you asked me before, Adam, is um, why we're bringing startups together with um, partners from the ecosystem. And here I, um, I want to take the lead. Um, and I'm sure that all of you have been there at some place uh, in one form or the other. Uh, and have experienced just how important it is to meet the right people at the right time. Uh, that might be how you met your wife or your boyfriend or how you found your current job, whatever it is. Um, we have identified that this is also true um, for startups that are aiming to add value to Swiss healthcare. They may, or you, um, as many startups are in the audience, you may not know where to start when you look for funding at the very beginning, or you may not know who to contact when you're looking to be in exchange with an insurance company, or uh, who the right person to talk to is um, when looking to get in touch with Big Pharma, how to navigate a hospital, um, be it in a large academic or um, in a smaller regional setting. And this is really where we come in with Swiss healthcare startups. Um, we look um, and we help startups to get in touch with the right partners at the right time. That um, is relevant through the entire um, journey that you startups find yourselves in. And we do this on the one hand at events. We have small events where our member community come together, where you pitch your ideas if you're early get targeted feedback we do it at larger events like our flagship event, a flagship event the digital health day that's taking place next week in Bern, actually on the 27th of october um, we do this through targeted connecting and we do it using our cortex the cortex is a database um, that unifies all relevant information about our almost 500 startup members. Here, a quick note, Adam, uh, you just mentioned the total of 4,600 startups total in Switzerland. Um, based on our estimation, uh, about 900 are active in health. So it is a very important um, area for innovation in Switzerland as well. So to finish it up, uh, if you're a startup looking for support or if you're an organization looking to get in touch with startups in healthcare, don't hesitate to reach out. Olivia, thank you so much. Next up, we have Nicholas, Managing Director of Digital Switzerland, a cross-industry initiative with more than 220 association members. It aims to strengthen and anchor Switzerland as a leading global location for digital innovation. Adam, thank you very much for the intro conference today. Almost 1,000 people is impressive, excellent. So why digital? I just came back, by the way, I'm happy I'm here. I thought I would be late. Just came back from Dubai for the World Expo from the Gitex. The world is getting digital, no question about that. The world is getting technology. And this is what Digital Switzerland is trying to do for the Swiss ecosystem, for startups, for SMEs, for the population, and for the academic and corporate world is to uh, move a bit, to shake everyone and to make sure everyone will go into digital transformation and remain innovative. In Switzerland, we only have talents in our infrastructure, as you presented before, Adam. We don't have much more, we have no abilities, so we rather have to invest much more in the future in our people. So what do we do at Digital Switzerland? Very shortly, we do politics, we do a lot of education, lifelong learning, 
We do a lot for the public dialogue, the digital day, which is now taking place all over the country for six weeks. We try to do a lot for startups. We've heard uh, previously uh, a lot is happening in the country. It's amazing. For healthcare, uh, Raphael is doing for all startups. You've shown the numbers, they are massive. But I believe Switzerland in 10 years, we won't be at 2 billion, we will be at 10, which is, by the way, today the size of Germany or France. And we still want to be top four in Europe uh, with Sweden, you know, just close to them. And this is what Digital Switzerland is doing too, with our 25 people in the team, our 250 members, is really shaking the country and making sure we catch up the train of the digital transformation and technology for the future. Nicholas, thank you very much. And uh, next up, we have Marcel, a program manager of the startup internationalization support at InnoSuisse, the Swiss Innovation Agency. InnoSuisse supports science-based innovation in the interest of industry and society. Thank you so much, Adam. And good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I, I have to admit, I'm humbled to be among all these elected speakers and to, to be given two minutes, 100 seconds, to try to add value to uh, such a broad and interdisciplinary and knowledgeable audience. Um, so this is a challenge <laughs> and try to tackle it by sharing three key learnings that I made through the past three years at InnoSwiss. Uh, through that, out that time, I was privileged enough to accompany and support almost 350 Swiss startups trying to internationalize. And you're all aware that Switzerland is a small country, so internationalization is, is really key. So um, my first learning out of this experience is really first Switzerland and Swiss startups are really world class. Even if we may crumble back when it comes in overall financing, the individual startups we have, they can really compete with the best startup nations around the globe. And this is something we cannot stress too much because we can really be proud about this. The second learning I have is, and this is, I think, true for, for many of us, not only startup entrepreneurs, but it's actually not the product or the innovation that is the key success factor, but it's mostly the team and the focus. And this is my second learning. Focus on what is important. Set yourself very clear and smart goals and ask yourself constantly, what are the three, maximum three things I myself can do and should master in order to maximize my success? And that leads me directly to my third um, key takeaway that I want to share with you. And this is think globally right from the start. Every innovation, every product have its lifespan. It's a limited window of opportunity. And if you don't think big, ambitious, and global from the start, you may lose your window of opportunity and your chance for success just come by. So these are my three key takeaways. If you want to know more about InnoSwiss and learning, please feel to reach out to me. Marcel, perfect. Um, very to the point. Lots of good learnings in a short time. Now, folks, before we go on with the conference, I do want to mention a couple of things. So first of all, uh, very good news. We have a WhatsApp group called Startups in Switzerland. In our last event, um, the group we did for startups in the Netherlands was uh, full within five or 10 minutes. So I've posted a link to that in chat. And also, I'll be traveling to uh, Zurich on Tuesday, November 9th. So let's meet up. Um, I have posted more information about that in the event chat as well. And um, all that information, if you can't click on the link in the event chat, uh, just go to startupnetwork.eu slash Switzerland. And before we continue, I just want to say thank you to our three sponsors who made this event possible. The first is Twilio, which is a cloud communications platform used by millions of startups to engage with billions of customers around the world. Um, they enable software developers to make and receive phone calls, text messages, and other communications using its web service APIs. And uh, Twilio Startups actually has a program uh, which attendees of this event can apply for to get uh, free credits and other resources. The next sponsor we have is Fiverr, something I've been using for years, um, which is a global marketplace that connects Swiss startups with uh, freelance talent in more than 500 categories, uh, digital marketing, programming, video animation. Um, it's really, really good for startups. And then finally, the last sponsor, last but not least, is Personio. 
HR software for startups and SMEs, which helps improve operational excellence to pave the way uh, for strategic work to shine. Uh, that means accelerating daily work, reducing administrative chaos, and ensuring that every core HR process works like a dream. Trudy is founder and chairman of two companies, Aqua SPE and Tally Fox, and she is also a venture partner at iGlobe Partners. Uh, she is a serial entrepreneur with uh, 30 years of international business experience. And Trudy, our, our question for you is, uh, what is your experience in starting software companies in Switzerland? Starting a software company in Switzerland. I actually started in Zurich with our full team and Today, our development teams, I'm sorry to say, are in, well, not sorry to say, but they're in Serbia and Lithuania. Um, we have the management from here and from other locations. And the reason for that has to do with cost and it has to do with scale um, because we had built up a team of uh, 15 developers. And for a startup in, in that stage, um, I just couldn't justify the cost, quite frankly. Uh, of course, the technology, expertise is here, but it depends. I would say if you have real core technology, something that's not just uh, you know, a, a web solution, but something where you have really innovative technology, better. Uh, for just pure software, unless you need some very special skill sets um, to manage it from here, you know, my experience is okay, but to build up a large software team, tough. Hey, Trudy, thank you. And it's very good to get those insights from you, especially as a uh, American coming into Switzerland. Folks, next up, uh, we have Michael. Uh, Michael Christmas has been uh, leading Farmer Connect as CEO since June 2020, championing the mission to humanize consumption through technology. He brings a deep understanding of the challenges in coffee and chocolate industries, having worked for global consumer companies such as Nestle and Mondelez. Uh, Michael is fascinated by tech, great food, and how they can be brought together. And uh, for the rest of this section, all the speakers will have the same question, which is what is your biggest lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic and your top tip for moving forward? Thank you so much, Adam, and uh, hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's fantastic to see how many people here. Um, so I'm Michael. Yes, I'm the CEO of Pharma Connect. We, uh, we are a startup that provides end-to-end -end traceability solution in the food industry, such as on those, those type of packaging, which you can see here probably a little bit of a QR code there. Um, so I, I believe, you know, the biggest effect of COVID has been the many constraints of our freedom uh, first, but a little bit closer to, to us at Pharma Connect has been the impact of the food global supply chain. You know, we had more time, all of us, I guess, to reflect specifically on our consumer consumption behaviors. And we saw a surge in consumer interest for more sustainable products. There's been a recent research in, in Deloitte that shows that almost 50%, so 5-0, of Gen Zs choose products by matching their values. Um, and almost the same amount would, would even boycott the brands that are not having a positive impact on values too. So there's really an acceleration. We, we at PharmaConnect decided to run our own research in the UK a couple of weeks back, and we're doing this in Japan as we speak. And again, we saw consumers are looking for more sustainable and innovative solutions. Uh, and the, sh the, the survey that we've done shows that 82% of consumers are more likely to consider buying a coffee, for example, that uses technology to prove that it has been picked ethically and sustainably. Um, and consumers all also want to know where the products they buy are coming from. And, and about 80% of them, of those coffee drinkers, would be more likely to buy a coffee brand that is enable um, them you know, to engage directly with the farmers that help produce the, the brew. So the use of, of technology, if we only take uh, UK, could bring an additional 50 million pounds a week uh, to the coffee business in the UK. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the biggest uh, uh, learning we got out of COVID. Thank and you, Michael. We really believe it's time for the food industry to wake up to the opportunities brought by that. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, Victor, uh, CEO at Sports Ed TV, which is the world's leading online sports education learning ecosystem and marketplace. Victor also co-founded Darkfish, a leader in video analysis in sports. 
Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for Switzerland. Hello from Miami, sunny Miami today. Uh, same question about COVID. What I saw is basically people were very quick to adapt and recover and innovate. Uh, an interesting statistic is 24% increase in startups from 2020, from 2019 to 2020, just in the US. So COVID was bad, but, you know, help people innovate and, and get, get quick on their feet. And I'm not speaking of only about masks and branded masks that you see everywhere. Uh, interestingly as well are the QR code. Uh, we love the QR codes and we have seen that something that has been around for 20 years became very popular quickly. One of the biggest impact, however, that I've seen is the online learning, online meetings like we have today and online working. And, and I think uh, it's a big change of behavior. It's, it's here to stay. Um, we, we have seen, you know, companies like Zoom, two, three years ago, you were asking people what Zoom was. You don't really know. I know it has become a verb. And I think this online learning situation in schools, we have seen schools and universities that only offer now online courses are here to change. So I think this kind of pandemic and, you know, something horrible that happened, see that people are re resilient, people embrace adapt and are very agile in the end and that's my take victor thank you, thank you so much next up we have uh, patrick marty ceo and cmo of and founder of hegias the world's first automated and browser-based virtual reality visu visualization and communication solution for real estate and um patrick how has uh covid19 uh, impacted hegias and how have you coped thank you very much adam hi to everyone. Um, since Hegias is a kind of a new solution using virtual reality, um, most people don't have the experience yet. And we, we actually give kind of a test drive in an unbuilt house um, for people who cannot imagine how it's going to be. So for us, the, the main impact was that we actually couldn't present it anymore because all of the trade fairs were canceled town. You couldn't meet uh, the people or the potential customers in their offices anymore. So uh, how to, to come over with it or to cope with it, um, we decided to develop a standalone app. That means we have uh, engineered or developed an app which is working or um, you install once on a so-called standalone virtual reality headset. So you don't need any additional equipment anymore. So that makes it easier to access and for us also to pitch remotely. That, that means that actually we can send out uh, just a simple virtual reality headset as the Oculus Quest 2 to a potential customer or partner investor and do then uh, pitch remotely. Because of our um, solution was already cloud and completely browser-based, um, we could actually, due to the crisis, in reinforce or enforce our unique solution, the unique, I would say, USP of the cloud and browser-based solution, so, so that you can have a walkthrough experience in an existing or planned building uh, all together. You don't have to be necessary in the same room. They can be everywhere in the world. And also our solution enables you that uh, you can materialize it, you can furniture it, you can easily share it. So all that together in a, in a plant building. And the main goal of Hegias is democratizing virtual reality. And so that actually helps even more to have an easier access. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And next up, we have uh, um, John Luke, founder of Digit Arena. He has 20 years engineering, sales, and people management experience in the ICT and broadcast industry, including 12 years in sports. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. The lessons learned from uh, COVID were three mainly. The first one is how to fail, because basically the company bankrupt due to COVID, which is a very hard lesson to learn. And uh, the sports events live advertisement in the stadium, which was our business, uh, just died because there were six months without any sports in any stadium. So no sports means no revenue. And this means this is basically the end. But one thing we learned was resiliency. Because basically, uh, even uh, what kills you can make you even stronger because we were discussing with our previous investors and uh, building a COVID resistant uh, new business model for the company. And we found out that even sports events were not 
uh, used at all, we were able to use one of the COVID-19 big trend, which was connected TV. And we've been moving our business model to uh, personalized advertisement on TV. And now the third thing we learned is how to restart up, meaning that we are raising money for our new venture, which is basically reusing the IP and the knowledge of uh, our previous startup and trying to build a new one. That's it. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Nasser Hefiana, founder and CEO of Nanoga, a Swiss edtech startup that develops high performance and cost effective large interactive digital whiteboards for K-18 schools and corporates. Thank you all for, for, for your participation and uh, glad to be part of this conference. So for me, probably the biggest learning was just to discover the value of time. The COVID came in, I think it was 16 of March 19, uh, and we've been informed that we cannot anymore work at office. Uh, clean room was closed. Partners sent us emails that we cannot work anymore. So we found ourselves like uh, almost without any activity. It was a bit shocking at the beginning, but I think after a few weeks, we decided just to stop what we were doing and then just think a little bit about what we've been doing the last three years. And uh, during three months of maybe uh, in-depth, cool thinking, we just review all our, let's say, processes, techniques, and we managed to just probably cut by two all expenses, all processes, uh, faster uh, the performance. So I realized that we could do that in the past, but the missing ingredient was time. We have no time. We've been running, 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 and running. And I think this COVID gave us just a nice break to rethink everything from scratch and just see what was done properly, what can be improved. So this learning was great because right now we are doing this process Every quarter, we have a week where we stop and we just try to evaluate what we've been doing in the past and is if it makes sense for the next step. So my advice, just really value time. That's okay. all. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Next up, we have Ian, founder of HexiSense. Uh, Ian is an entrepreneur working at the intersection of semiconductor and vacuum technologies. Thank you very much for having me, Adam. Nasser mentioned the value of time and, and learning to reappreciate it. Uh, I think maybe my key learning is that everything is going to take more time. Uh, so uh, just as uh, Nasser, I'm a hardware entrepreneur and we've all learned the key importance of the semiconductor industry in the newspapers. So there's a, for those of you who are not aware, there's a, a chip shortage that affects all the products that we have in our daily lives. And uh, when you're trying to make new products or to deliver results on time to customers, uh, everything becomes very sensitive to the lead times on chips. Uh, and so I think my key learning from the crisis is that uh, you need to factor in more time and that you need to uh, perform a sensitivity analysis of your supply chain and your products. And uh, in the case that something is uh, uh, not going to come through, you have to get ready to improvise, whether that means a simple substitution uh, buying things secondhand, industrial surplus, and uh, that's the need to continue to move forward despite some of these uh, logistical considerations that uh, are appearing as a result of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, Ian. Uh, next up, we have Boris, head of product, AI code analysis at Sneak, uh, co founder of the ETH Zurich spin off DeepCode.ai, uh, the only AI for software code engine in the world that empowers Sneak's ability to find and automatically fix vulnerabilities in code, open source dependencies, containers, and infra infrastructure as code. Thank you for reading all that, Adam. <laughs> uh, I was careful. So yeah, as we uh, as we just chatted, there is a chip shortage in the world, and during the pandemic, pretty much we all realized we are much more reliant on digital technology and services than we used to be. And as we were reflecting as a human being, what's important for us, uh, uh, we actually were stuck with more and more digital technologies. Um, and what uh, DeepCode, uh, as a Swiss startup, did was uh, simply putting it enabled uh, what Grammarly did for text. Uh, we did the exact same thing for software code enabling the, the millions of developers around the world to kind of deliver those technologies to us uh, much much faster and safer. And uh, what we did and what we learned operationally uh, in deep code during the pandemic is that, well, you can continue innovating, you can continue growing if you're in the right area, unfortunately, for some, uh, some other areas. 
Uh, but actually, the ongoing growth and adding new team members actually gets harder and harder. If you want to do groundbreaking and continuous innovation within the teams, you actually have to have some kind of face-to-face -face exposure, especially for new team members and uh, teams that are forming right now. Uh, so what we realized, I mean, there were plenty of startups that raised money during that time, except the first couple of months. Uh, we ourselves started to merge with a larger company, that being Sneak.io, that had kind of the same vision uh, to actually grow and deliver uh, these uh, revolutionary uh, technologies to the uh, to developers around the world. And, and that's show that I mean, the startup community can push forward and continue moving and continue innovating during that time. Uh, and so pretty much at Sneak right now, what we do, we uh, the deep code engine is there. It enables the global development community deliver those technologies that we all depend on across open source, government, pretty much every single industry that we can think of and pretty much eliminate the code risks uh, uh, for the developers while they deliver better code and they do it in a faster way. Um, so in short, what are the learnings? Definitely create opportunities uh, uh, for your teams to interact face-to-face, -face. doesn't have to be full-time, and definitely continue working as entrepreneurs. I mean, the, despite what type of problems we're faced with, we always gonna find a new solution. That's our goal to kind of overcome problems, even that sometimes meaning finding a new startup, as uh, we just heard. Thank you, guys. Yep. Hey, thank you very much. And now we go on to our first 10 minute chat, uh, and it, this will be with Frank uh, from Twilio. Uh, Twilio, as I mentioned earlier, is a cloud communications platform uh, used by millions of startups to engage with billions of customers around the world. Um, now, Frank, you are actually based in London. You've worked a lot with startups. I suppose I was thinking today about our conversation. There is customer engagement, but also customer retention is a very, very important thing. A lot of startups are great at marketing. They're great at selling, but once they do the delivery of their product, the clients don't renew. So what's your opinion on this? What should be prioritized? Um, thank you so much, Adam. And thank you for your time, everyone. I think, uh, Adam, to your point, what we've seen is that historically, technology has been a moat for startups in terms of defensibility, pricing as well. And we've also seen like a variety of different modes that startups use for defensibility and to scale. But one of the key areas we're seeing that startups can actually distinguish themselves is through customer engagement. And I think a lot of the time, startups tend to focus on growth and really doubling down on their sales and their revenue. But a key thing is to look at retention and understand you know, what is the customer experience that's being provided? Are they really listening to their, cust their customers fundamentally? And they're really trying to understand how they can use this to A, um, double down on retention and then further drive and improve customer growth and fundamentally the customer experience as a whole. Great. And how does a startup, I suppose, uh, drive customer growth? What are the key factors? I think fundamentally really being able to listen to your customers as closely as possible. I think the really interesting thing we've seen on the back of COVID is digital transformation is accelerating rapidly. And I think what's great about APIs and, and just what Twilio is doing in general within the space is really empowering you know, customers and businesses to think about how they reach their customers and how to really embed communications better within their product. I've always said to founders when we discuss it with them that com communications fundamentally empowers your ability to reach your customers in terms of customer engagement. And this then informs product market fit and your capacity to like further grow and scale. So I think if founders and just businesses are able to really double down on how they can focus on retaining their customers, and just doing a lot of A-B testing, focus groups, better segmentation, I think that can really empower them to double down and scale that growth. When startups uh, are analyzing their sales, uh, do you think there's any false positives that they can um, uh, find? I think naturally you always tend to see a lot of false positives that appear. You know, you could be having really great numbers, high sales numbers in terms of, you know, your first customers. Really the crux is, you know, are these customers coming back? Are you able to retain them? And the only way you're really able to understand this is really through understanding what communication channels are you utilizing to reach your customers. If, for example, they go to purchase a product and then they don't finish you know, completing that journey on the basket, it's really understanding what is the reasons and why. I think great businesses have the capacity to preempt what is happening with their customers. Um, customer engagement experience is really all about the empathy the emotional resonance. And this is a really differentiating factors. Startups and businesses who really understand how to do this well will definitely succeed. 
And I think that's really where the focus and the challenge um, currently lies. Great. And before uh, you spoke, I was actually doing a couple of polls just to know where everybody in the conference is from. So three quarters of you are in Switzerland. I, I'm from Ireland, so uh, I, I, I'm an exception. And most of you uh, are not in Zurich. You're actually spread across the entire country. And not just in Zurich, but uh, many of the smaller cantons in Switzerland as well. Uh, Frank, another thing that we actually shared as well is what type of startups are in this conference. Now, for you, um, when it comes to different types of customer engagement, do you see a big difference between B2B and B2C startups? Um, naturally, there's always, there tends to be a leaning more towards B2B startups and then uh, just a slightly smaller skew towards B2C startups. But I do think like irrespective of whether you are B2B or B2C or B2B2C, I do think fundamentally thinking about, you know, the channels you're utilizing, how you're communicating, how you're engaging with your customers, um, doing a, sub a substantial amount of A-B testing on, you know, channel preferences, providing a multi-channel approach um, for your customers always helps. And I think as we've seen as well, it's not just about your channel, but also, you know, contacting your customers or reaching at the right place and at the right time. And I think that's really where the trick is, which is understanding not only the right channels or how to reach your customers at scale, but when to do so. Yeah, and I recently read a book called um, I'll Be Back, and it's all about how to uh, get your customers to say, I'll be back again and again and again. Uh, we're doing the poll now, actually, and in terms of customer engagement, what do you make of the differences between B2B and B2C? In terms of the poll, I think what's interesting is that, as we've discussed many times, email is very much the foundational uh, component of communication. So a lot of startups, both B2B and B2C tend to use the email in terms of their email marketing, their transactional emails that go out. And then on top of that, they then build out, for example, whether it's SMS or WhatsApp and leverage a variety of different channels. I think irrespective of, again, what type of business you're building, I think the key element is to think and map out your customer life cycle and just the different areas where there is opportunities for you to add additional value or reinforce trust and then think about what are the best channels for you to do this. I think the challenge tends to be, you know, if you've got maybe 2,000, 3,000 customers, how do you go about doing this at scale, providing an omni-channel approach? Um, as we can see in the polls, email, 60%, you know, followed by programmable video, phone calls, and then obviously a variety of different social media platforms. So what you're seeing is email is a really important touch point for customers, followed by a variety of different channels. And so I think it's a great opportunity for founders and customers to think about, okay, how do we reach our customers? What is the type of content um, we're trying to share? And what is fundamentally the action that we're really trying to get them um, to do at the end of all of this? Yeah, and something I've noticed about emails, um, do you have any tips on how to send them? So I have a rule, even if it's very manual, always have the person's name at the beginning of the email. So probably all of you today got an email from me uh, with your name at the start. And um, what about you, Frank? Any tips in that regard? Uh, in terms of tips, definitely providing you know preference centers is always good i think short uh, subject lines anything that really clearly indicates you know who you are as a business and the value that you're trying to provide and i think taking a step back as well understanding the cadence or the frequency by which you'll be engaging with the customer do they want to receive emails on a weekly bi-weekly or you know monthly basis so i think there's good behaviors and habits that you know startups can adopt in order to reach their customers leveraging email but understanding that Fundamentally, this is just one channel and one approach. And again, you know, coming back to that concept of A-B testing, segmenting your customers, listening to them to provide that omni-channel approach along with personalization. Yeah, and we have a very interesting poll happening now, actually. The importance of the telephone. Do you think the importance of the telephone is declining or getting more important uh, these days? I think it's becoming um, more substantial. I think, but when we think of telephone in terms of like, for example, the contact center, there is still value and a role there to play. I think obviously you do have, for example, chatbots and a variety of different APIs that can now help navigate this. So in terms of phone call, as we know, it, it is changing. But I think from a customer perspective and from a business perspective, customers are looking to get support, great customer service in a timely capacity. And so for example, using phone call or programmable video along with email can still be a really great channel for customers to engage um, with businesses and for founders and startups to really engage with their customers. So I think it's not the most important channel, but it still has a very important role to play uh, in an increasingly digital world. Okay, thank you, Frank.
next up, folks, we are going back to Swiss entrepreneurs in Switzerland. And uh, our first speaker of this section will be uh, Serban uh, Mogos, uh, co-founder and COO of iWare, a Swiss computer vision startup that develops 3D eye tracking software. He's a tech entrepreneur who graduated with PhD in Stra strategy and entrepreneurship from Carnegie Mellon University with research on high growth firms and growth policy. He has also co-founded two NGOs for entrepreneurship education in Romania. And um, Serban, the, the uh, question for you and some other speakers in this section is name one book that has helped you on your startup journey and one lesson you have learned from it. Thank you very much, Adam, for the invitation and the intro. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, so as I'm starting the second uh, section on books, i uh, start with a quick backstory. Uh, since I was very young, I've always been a, a huge science fiction fan. And I've always thought, uh, why aren't we working on, on these amazing technologies in, in real life uh, to, you know, to see flying cars and, and to colonize Mars and so on? Uh, so we know that most of humanity's improvements happen in uh, small increments um, over a long period of time. And there's good reasons and frameworks for that, uh, like, for example, the Lean Startup approach that I'm sure most of us know. Um, however, the, I believe that the huge, uh, truly transformational innovations for humanity and we're thinking of in science fiction terms, um, usually come from a person or a team that goes against the status quo. Uh, so for me, the, the book that really I found that best describes this style of uh, transformative thinking is uh, Peter Thiel's uh, Zero to One. Uh, so I would recommend that. I, it resonated with me. Uh, I'm also a supporter of this type of uh, truly transformational uh, entrepreneurship. As entrepreneurs, we, we see the problems around us and we propose solutions on how to solve them. Uh, so we know that uh, you know there are changes for the better that clearly need to happen, and we need to make them happen. Uh, so what, as our role is to um, find these alternative scenarios for the future and, and implement them. And so the the key lesson that I took from the book uh, and the way it, in, it has impacted me is uh, that I realized from Thiel's uh, point of view that also in business terms there is a market for big innovations. And personally, I, and I encourage other people and other entrepreneurs as well. I'd like to spend my entrepreneurial energy to build companies that challenge the status quo and be optimistic about reaching a, a positive outcome. Uh, so I will end with uh, the last uh, point, which TL calls the contrarian question, is uh, what is the important truth that a, a few people agree with you on? Thank you. Sirvan, uh, thank you very much. And it is an excellent book, probably my number one recommendation. And next up, folks, we have Katrine, a director at Meadows Sarrel, uh, which works with exciting life sciences startups and growth stage companies to launch products, accelerate business growth, and drive adoption of their therapies in the market. Katrine is also a scale-up coach at InnoSuisse. And uh, our question for you is, what are key insights from looking for your own startup idea in Switzerland? Thank you, Adam. Um, hi, nice to meet everyone. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to share because, uh, you know, lots of people speak about great books. So I wanted to share uh, my own experience. So I have always worked in healthcare and life sciences and uh, left corporate, you know, in 2014, a while ago, and wanted to, to be honest, wanted to have a quite a break and was looking at some startup ideas and came upon the idea to found a, uh, or to create a a business around coffee trucks. There was really not great coffee here in the, at least in the Romandie in the French speaking part of Switzerland. Uh, the truck, the coffee truck, I, I have a lot of connections to the US. So it was a big growing business at the time. And there were lots of, you know, appealing things around that, you know, that concept. And when I started researching it, being in Switzerland, it was clear it was here in the, in this part of Switzerland. Um, I realized there's a, a lot of things that you need to take into consideration when uh, when discussing or, or researching for a startup. And Switzerland, you know, coffee truck is a grinding business. There's long hours. You need to be able to park, uh, you know, where you want to park, where the people are. You need to have regulations that are favorable for this. You need labor that's basically, uh, you know, available and cheap and works long hours. And other things, and it turns out that when you actually found a business in Switzerland or a business as a startup uh, location, um, it's much better to focus on the things that we are really good at. Um, it's really difficult uh, regulation-wise for the for the truck, you know, food truck business. 
in Switzerland still is probably better now. Labor is very expensive <laughs> um, and, and not that, you know, available. There's a lot of competition for manual labor. So I ended up phone, founding a consultancy that specialized in healthcare and working with startups, working with healthcare system data, because we have a huge amount of educated graduates, you know, young people working. We are extremely good in, in data and in understanding AI and, you know, in digital, like many, many speakers before me have mentioned. Um, that's also a worthwhile business. I, you know, can pay the salaries for my teams that I, that I need to pay or want to pay my team. And therefore, I think the key learning for me was to really understand where you are, especially in the context of Switzerland, understand what makes Switzerland a great place for startups and for what type of startups and for what key competences that are basically really uh, need to be here in Switzerland or should be here in Switzerland versus other things that basically, um, you know, other nations and other countries can do much better. Other people can do much better. And I'm pretty, I'm, you know, very happy with this choice. Although I, I do still think there's a need for a coffee truck in Switzerland for really good coffee trucks in Switzerland that serves businesses um, you know, that's not an espresso. Katrin, so. thanks so <laughs> Thank much. You, Adam. But yeah, I need coffee too after after this event. <laughs> Our next speaker is John Klepper, uh, founder and CEO of Pipra. He is a serial entrepreneur working in health tech, striving to create measurable societal impact through innovation in healthcare. He's especially interested in how disruptive technologies can further drive medical, societal, and environmental change. Disciplined entrepreneurship by Bill Owlett from MIT, probably one of the one of the most uh, specifically learned about profiling the persona and how important that is. We did over 200 stakeholder interviews. And then after that, we learned from him that what we really should have done also is find out who we're selling to as a person. Who, who are they? Like what, are the, what motivates them personally? Because when we buy, you know, we're all human beings. So that was a big learning which we can use now prospectively. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, John. Next up, we have Valer uh, Stepanov, co-founder of Watch Advisor. As an experienced co-founder and investor, Val builds digital startup companies with unique and scalable products. And uh, Valer um, the question for you again is name one book that has helped you on your startup journey. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Val Stepanov, I'm co-founder of the luxury media company, Watch Advisor. So what we are doing is, in fact, we are doing content. We are a media company. We have a very good relationship to the watch brands. And we are super proud after three years in business, we have 200,000 monthly users who consume our content, 50,000 followers on YouTube. And our aim is to build an e-commerce platform to leverage our strong community in 2022. So therefore, we're going to raise $1 million in capital to build the e-commerce platform and to leverage our strong user base. That's the team. We are super proud to have a Google guy here down right in the advisory board, who is, uh, of course, a watch, watch aficionado. And um, the key question is, um, how can you manage um, in, a, in a luxury industry the people? And uh, I just heard that it's important to listen to customers, but the question is, how do you get uh, to the visibility and how do you get uh, uh, that they start talking to you? And the luxury industry is, is driven by a long success, less success of the last 20 years. So the egos and personalities are quite big in this industry. And what helped me is to understand what is uh, the people behavior and the behavior wheel of change wheel of uh, Susan Michi helped me quite a lot because behavior is driven mainly through three points, which is capabilities, opportunities and motivation. And um, the motivation, in fact, can be drilled down to three key points. So one, the power people, the success people, the relationship people or a mix out of it. And if you understand what the triggers the people you start communicating in this way so you get um, the reception and um, it's quite easy to understand where the trigger and if you start communicating in this area they start listening to you and then you can have an impact thank you okay thank you very much Next up, uh, we have uh, Diego, founder of Gossip, which develops an intelligent to-do list assistant that learns from you and helps you organize your day. Besides running a startup, Diego also plays for the baseball Swiss national team. 
Thank you very much, Adam, and hi, everyone else. Um, I don't have any slides like the people before me, and so it's just me. Um, the thing what we do is we target B2C people from all over the world with our productivity system. Um, so the key thing for us is to really iterate our product and get the most people from them and make it better to reach product market fit, obviously. And here, a really great book that probably everyone knows already is The Lean Startup. Um, and, it's, and it's really good uh, that you can reach this product market fit. However, the thing is, um, theoretically, it's a nice thing. Practically, it's sometimes a little bit harder because it's done, you really have individual cases. Um, so what I would like to refer to is more uh, article and a podcast uh, that, that we have used uh, in order to make a, a really nice process and to get customer feedback. And this comes from the superhuman approach. Uh, they call themselves the, um, the, the fastest email experience ever made. And what we've done is they have set up this approach um, where, you, where you talk to the customer, you invite them to a video call before you actually show them the product and so on. And they really show you how to systematically get closer uh, to the product market fit. Um, and this was really helpful for us. Um, and one lesson that we learned is that um, that the people are actually more willing to take video calls with you than you think. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing tool, um, how to get to know your users, how to get to know their problems, um, how to find out what, how you can increase the retention. Um, and they're also uh, more willing to come back and provide you feedback because you really make this uh, connection with them and you make this community. Um, so this really helps. So if any one of you um, wants to see these articles and maybe the podcast, uh, send out the link and I will happy, be happy uh, to share those. Diego, thank you very much. Next up, uh, we have um, Mehdi, co-founder and CMO of Smartest Learning, which uses artificial intelligence to help teachers create interactive exercises from their teaching materials so they can spend more time engaging with students and less time preparing their lessons. Thanks, Adam. So um, at Smartest.io, we use computer vision and natural language processing to, to help teachers create this interactive learning experience. Uh, we founded the company um, two years ago, and uh, the book I chose is the, the Four Steps to the Epiphany by Steve Blank. Because in our search for the holy grail of product market fit, there is one lesson in this book that helped me a lot. I actually wish I had learned it uh, earlier in the journey, but um, it's that you should build your solution for a very particular kind of customer, what he calls early evangelists. So these are people who are aware they have a problem, they have tried to solve it, but they did not yet find a suitable solution. And because Smartest lets you create interactive exercises from any teaching material, we, we thought it could fit almost every school and teacher. So we reached out to a diverse group of prospects and um, many of them were interested in our technology, but they didn't really have a burning platform. They, they were fine with the status quo. Or worse, they came with a list of 10 must have features without which our product was of no use to them. And the problem is by the time you build all of these features and get this kind of customers to buy your solution, you burned all your cash and the game is practically over. So what the book recommends is to focus instead on visionary customers who, who love the product you're already building. And they will give you the feedback you need to improve your solution over time. And the added benefit is they will help you get new customers because they are enthusiastic about what you do. And we've seen this happen several times already in the last month. So this focus on early evangelist is in my view, the, the best way to find your product market fit. Uh, that's a lesson we, we try to put in practice every day at Smartest. Mehdi, thank you very much. Next up, we have Rolf, CEO and co-founder of TwingTech. Uh, Rolf has co-founded two high-tech startups and was founding director of a public-private partnership R&D center. He has also fundraised several millions in equity and grants and has more than 80 peer-reviewed publications and 20 patents. And Rolf, we have a different question for you, which is um, you have co-founded two tech startups. What is your vision for the technology of the future? Yeah, thanks, Adam, for this uh, great event. So, in fact, we, we have incredible technology today, powerful, efficient, and useful. However, in one critical aspect, it lacks very much behind, and that's sustainability. So, our technology has to become sustainable, otherwise it will sooner or later kill us. So, so what's sustainable technology? terms it's technology that does not produce any waste so no material to be disposed at the end of life no greenhouse gases produced 
during its life. And this is actually not easy at all. Also, so-called uh, clean technologies such as PV cells produce quite a lot of waste. And actually, only nature has figured out so far how sustainability sustainability really works. A good starting point to become more sustainable is to use as less material as possible for whatever job that needs to be done. And in my first startup, we have developed new lightweight structures where we replace the big part of the material of a girder by compressed air. And uh, these air beams are used now in temporary buildings. And in TwinTech, uh, my current startup use kind of a kite to harness energy from wind. And in fact, we replaced the steel tower of a wind turbine by a tether and a control algorithm, which saves more than 90% of, of the material and unlocks wind resources at higher altitudes where the wind is much stronger. So replacing steel by smart algorithms brings also economical benefits. Well, in, in summary, my vision for the technology of the future is a sustainable technology. We are still far away. In fact, we might never completely reach it, but this is a one big step we still need to achieve with technology. So I would say let's put up our sleeves and start to work on it. Ralph, thank you very much. And next up, we have our second 10-minute uh, chat, and this will be with David from Fiverr. Thanks, thanks, Adam, for having me. So basically, um, my topic today is, uh, you know, to talk about outsourcing and how uh, startups can efficiently use uh, outsourcing in order to scale up very efficiently. And I think, uh, you know, outsourcing is uh, some it's a business practice basically that describes, you know, to hire a third party outside of your company to pro perform services or create productions that were traditionally performed in house. Uh, the traditional way of, let's say, outsourcing uh, mostly happened offline, yeah, which is a very tedious and lengthy process uh, with a lot of uncertainties. Um, everybody who did it understands the headaches yeah, attached to it from sourcing the right talent, freelancer, to negoti negotiating contracts, communication, uh, submitting deliverables, to invoicing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this uh, traditional way of outsourcing normally takes 30 days yeah? uh, at Fiverr. And this is basically our mission is to do it as easy as an e-commerce experience. So we are having a two-sided marketplace at Fiverr uh, where we connect businesses to freelancers. Uh, we are operating in 190 uh, countries worldwide, basically erasing all these traditional pain points uh, via the platform. So it's a very straightforward uh, process. It's just like shopping on Amazon or Etsy. And the normal time you spend from visiting the site to you know, placing an order takes about 15 minutes instead of 30 days. And now you can you know, do the math of how efficient this can be for every startup in order to you know, acquire and hire uh, uh, freelance talents uh, who are highly uh, specialized experts uh, in several tasks. Uh, Fiverr has the biggest catalog right now. We have over 500 service categories from uh, programming in tech over graphics and design, online marketing, uh, where you can find basically all the talent you need in order to scale up efficiently. Okay, David, thank you. And just, um, I did a poll there. So most startups in this conference have used outsourcing before. And um, what have they outsourced? IT, accountancy are big things. Is it a, this a surprise to you or is it typical for startups? You no, know, it's absolutely typical. Yeah, uh, Normally startups, they have very little fundings and uh, huge goals. Uh, and hiring people basically adds an overhead to their, you know, uh, resources, which are mostly not as big as uh, corporates. So outsourcing several either, you know, tasks is absolutely the way to, to do it, especially as a startup. Great. And you mentioned um, I've used outsourcing before. So hello to my video editor uh, <laughs> who I use on Fiverr. Um, and I suppose my pain point was, yeah, uh, I'm only one person. Um, I can't, uh, it doesn't make sense to hire a full-time accountant or a full-time video editor. Um, what other pain points would result in a startup or scale-up using outsourcing? 
I mean, <clears throat> the, no the traditional or normal uh, uh, way, uh, areas where, you know, especially startups outsource is really programming in tech. Uh, we all know that uh, devs and programmers are very, very expensive people to hire. The second area is marketing, yeah, which has a lot of different, let's say, resources you need, yeah, from uh, designers to texters to a landing page uh, or UX designers. So these are traditional, let's say, areas where, you know, normally startups are looking into outsourcing solutions. Yeah. And now that we have defined what outsourcing is, how can somebody do outsourcing in the best way? So for example, on Fiverr, I have another website, latinamerica.ie. It's a Spanish language website. I'm not a fluent uh, native Spanish speaker. So what I did was I sent the same translation piece to three or four different translators. Mm -hmm. and they all did a good job, but there's one translator who gave it to me in one day. Everything was excellent, well laid out. Uh, that's what I did. But what else can people do to ensure they have a good experience? Uh, first of all, I mean, briefing is the absolutely the most important thing. Yeah, you need to understand and you need to know what you need. Yeah, and and um, and then look for the respective freelance expert, which you can easily find within a few clicks on, on the platform. Then, you know, you have, uh, we have certain, let's say, uh, functionalities on the platform, which um, assures that, you know, you are um, handling or talking to the right guys. A, um, is the quality good? Yeah, this is where we have a rating system in place just as an Amazon, yeah, uh, um, where, you know, people who already, um, work together with a certain freelancer, um, can rate his uh, performance, his communication skills, his deliverables, uh, which I think uh, is very, very important in order to create trust. Trust is always a big issue and with every marketplace. Second thing is that um, uh, also there are some, let's say, securities which we have in place towards our buyers. So usually you pay up front, we hold the money, and we only pay out the uh, freelancer once you approve the final delivery, which is, um, I think, a huge benefit for every uh, buyer and startup to make sure that uh, they get what they need. Yeah, and in our last conversation, actually, before this conference, um, you surprised me because you actually said, don't outsource all the time, only outsource when necessary, because sometimes uh, some tasks are better in-house. Absolutely. I mean, you have sensitive uh, business areas, yeah, such as, I don't know, your data. You don't want to outsource or give away, uh, you know, your, your critical sensitive business areas uh, to a third party. You want to own it. Uh, you want to understand your financials. You want to understand, you know, um, all the, let's say, really sensitive parts of your business. This is what you keep in-house. Um, if you can, you know, uh, or if you need uh, any, let's say, additional tasks, which may also uh, touch these sensitive areas of your business, uh, it's always better uh, that basically to, to protect, yeah, to protect your core let's say, value of your company, and then uh, basically just give bits and pieces uh, out uh, in order to scale up and, you know, uh, make things work, uh, which you, uh, or scale up uh, the things you, you're looking, you, you want to do. Yeah? Great. Well, th thank you, David, for that. And I've shared more information in the chat box um, about Fiverr. And folks, we will move on to the next section, which again is Swiss startups uh, in Switzerland. Our next speaker will be Sylvain, a co-founder of Impact, a venture that seeks to bring innovative solutions for impact investing. Impact is a web platform that leverages the collective intelligence of a large community of members to assess the social and environmental impact of large listed companies. And in this section, we're actually focusing a lot more on failures and investment. Um, so my question for you is, what is your top piece of advice for startups looking for funding? Thanks, Adam. Um, impact is aiming at uh, covering thousands of companies and by covering thousands of companies, that means collecting tens of thousands of analyses. So we, we are with this conundrum of uh, companies which have to make very significant investment upfront, actually, before they can start onboarding clients, uh, paying clients. And what I'm going to say should resonate with all the startups which have significant financing need. 
And I just have three pieces of advice. The first one is really you need to plan your funding a long time in advance. You need to build, obviously, uh, scenarios, alternative scenarios. You need, at the same time, to make you know, your investor dream. And at the same time, you have to plan for the worst. But more importantly, plan to close your next round of financing a long time in advance. You know, For us, for the last round, six months in advance, we already knew more or less who our investors were going to be. We got the cash, actually, just in the month before running out of cash because you know of the legal and banking paperwork even in Switzerland. My second piece of advice is find patient investors. Don't focus too early on venture capital, especially if you're a company like ours. You will only be of interest to them, I guess, you know, once you have really recurring revenues. And your network is usually the best place to start because people are investing, you know, as much in you as they're investing in your idea. And since your, your, your project is likely to require seven rounds of investment, make sure that uh, you know, these investors have deep pocket because yeah, they be expected to participate. Last, last piece of advice is beware of dilution. That's something you know, obviously we did experience. I would say don't be shy with your initial value companies. It's very difficult to put a value on a startup. So go aim high, be ambitious. Tries to raise money gradually because uh, you know it's better if you do that once you hit a new milestone and consider early in the process you know mechanism like stock option it's never too early so that you are avoiding that dilution and you're avoiding the situation where you're losing control of the company those are so you know my piece of advice for today great thank you where we have Cynthia, a Chief Executive and Creative Director at Spice Journeys, which innovates storytelling by creating omnichannel experiences and new ways to connect. Uh, Cynthia is also an Executive Board Member of the Oxford Entrepreneurs Network, and she will be launching a Swiss chapter in 2022. And Cynthia, how has a failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Hi, so thanks so much, Adam, and hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the great question as well. Um, just uh, briefly in terms of background, I used to work in senior management for large organizations like Swiss banks and the United Nations. I gave all that up to finish writing a novel and to found my company, Spice Journeys, um, which, as Adam mentioned, is a purpose-driven company aimed at innovating storytelling. So for me, it all started with my first novel, The Spice Temple. Um, it's the first of six, and it's a work of literary or culinary fiction. Um, but I wanted to create more than just a book. So what I call the novel experience is really about multi-layered sensory storytelling and creating omni-channel experiences. So back to the question, the word failure is an interesting one. Um, I think when starting something completely new, you have to learn every day um, and so much can be perceived as a failure. So for me, marketing still remains a challenge. Um, but a recent favorite failure came with COVID and lockdowns. So at that time, I wanted to share something positive. So I wrote a short series for animation, and it was about really how you can go within um, when you can't go out, as we all had to do during COVID. So just at that time, when I started to write, I was contacted by a film producer. We engaged a very talented animator, um, but after months of working together, um, he unfortunately had to leave for a big client. So this could be seen as a failure, um, but new projects have resulted including an upcoming uh, dramatized podcast, so next month, and starting, um, starting to create a metaverse linking storytelling to NFTs, gaming, and brand alliances. So for me, regardless of the perceived failure, um, hold on to your vision, pivot, and stay open to serendipity. Something better can be around the corner. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And next up, we have Matthias, uh, CEO of Exoscale, the leading Swiss European cloud service provider. And Matthias is a positive, forward looking, and versatile professional with more than 20 years of progressive experience within the IT industry, primarily in the area of software solutions and IT cloud automation. Uh, he is also director of cloud and IT services at A1 Digital International. And uh, Matthias, our question for you is. Uh, what do startups in Switzerland need to consider with regards to digital sovereignty and data privacy uh, when it comes to using the cloud for their product? Thank you, Adam. Many of you are doing digital products. Um, this means your product needs to run on some kind of infrastructure, and uh, typically it's the cloud. 
But which cloud should you use, especially when it comes to data privacy and sovereignty? If you value those two aspects, um, for example, if you're in the health tech industry or fintech industry or any other discipline where you also manage personal data. Many companies choose to uh, go with U.S. hyperscalers, and very often they're not aware of the U.S. Cloud Act and its implications. The U.S. Cloud Act is some legislation that has been passed by the Trump administration very early on to clarify who can access data stored at U.S.-owned data centers, U.S.-owned cloud provider data centers overseas. It very clearly defines that data stored overseas, for example, in Switzerland, needs to be treated like if the data center is on U.S. soil. To make it a bit more concrete, if the U.S. government, law enforcement institutions, or some small little district court wants to get data stored in Switzerland, they turn to the U.S.-owned cloud provider who needs to hand over the data. Without informing the Swiss government, without informing a Swiss court, or any Swiss law enforcement institution, or the Swiss person that is under investigation, which is clearly in conflict with GDPR or the Swiss DSG. So if you want to guarantee your customers that their data stays in Switzerland and that Swiss legislation and institutions are not being bypassed, you cannot really go with a U.S. cloud provider as long as the U.S. cloud exists, act exists. But luckily, there are local and regional alternatives in Switzerland and in the European Union, like Exoscale, for example. If you want to learn more about the facts about this issue, we've done a white paper on US Cloud Act versus GDPR, the Swiss DSG and Bank Act. And if you're interested, I'm happy to share it with you via LinkedIn. Okay, Matthias, thank you very much. And next up, uh, we have Dave, co-founder and CEO of Already, a startup that is offering turnkey uh, software as a service products to launch, manage, and automate employee-driven innovation programs within large organizations. Uh, Dave, you're also teaching the Lean Startup Academy course at ETH Zurich, and um, he also guests lectures at leading Swiss universities. Um, so Dave, uh, what is your favorite failure? Cool. Thanks, Adam, and nice to meet everyone. Before I start sharing one of my favorite failures, I would like to give you some context. We started as an innovation team at Swisscom running the Kickbox Entrepreneurship Program, where all employees can work on their ideas to build the future of the company. And when the program grew, we've developed the software to automate the program, scale it efficiently, and also solve our own challenges. And when we received a lot of requests from peers, other innovation managers who wanted to work with the software we have built, we saw a startup opportunity and decided to turn it into a product and offer it as a B2B SaaS solution on the market. And we eventually won our first five enterprise customers, big step. And we had this awesome idea to onboard them all together in a cohort. And it was a huge failure. They had all different needs and we found out it was impossible to onboard them all together at the same time. And we were sitting in our first group onboarding session and they didn't like our approach at all. And imagine these were the clients you were fighting and working so hard to win and not really an easy moment for us. So we quickly pivoted and started to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, which worked much better and is our approach until today. And this failure actually helped us to find the product market fit with early adopters and was the birth of our customer community that we have until today. And we have now monthly exchange with all our customer, now over 20 and they share their experience, their best practice, they learn from each other. And we also start to co-create the program further with our custom community and include them actively in the product development. For example, the kickbook, it's like the method we are mainly working with, has been co-written by over 100 global innovation leaders, including all of our customers. And my personal learning out of that failure was like, don't overthink things too much, just get the ball rolling and iterate along the way. And that's how we're building the business now, how we manage to spin out of Swisscom and how we are now scaling internationally as a as a ready with more than 30 people around the world. Thanks very much. Dave, well done uh, on all your success. And next up, we have uh, Oriol, a co-founder and CEO of Chemiex, the first online exchange and information platform that enables companies to buy and sell vitamins, amino acids, ad additives, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, and other raw materials for pharma, vets, food, and feed industries. Yeah, so as I was saying, we're basically a trading and information platform for raw materials in life science, and that would be pharma, veterinary, and human nutrition and animal nutrition which is a traditional industry with where relationships matter a lot and which was very hard to disrupt. 
entrepreneurs usually also in the beginning, you tend to have a very passionate idea of what you want to develop, what you want to give to clients, which does not always match what they want, what they need or what they expect, right? And this, I wanted to maybe link it with the concepts of the early evangelists that were mentioned before and the pivoting, right? So we had to do a lot of understanding what clients would like to have, although they might not tell you or what they would expect to having a tool that makes their lives better, right? And as soon as you understand what needs to be changed to develop that solution, then of course, uh, you, you really see a difference in their or a switch in their behavior, right? And as of today, I can say that we have clients, once this pivoting has been done or these uh, adjustments have been done, we're now dealing with more than 2,000 clients in 60 countries. We were the most voted um, food tech company in Switzerland in the top 100 Swiss startup awards in 2020 and in 2021. And the company is now operationally profitable and growing say more than 100% year on year. And we're planning to now scale up and grow the team internationally in the series A. So what I want to say with this is that it's never easy in the beginning, but if you get to hear or listen to your clients and adjust to what they want, I think things can turn up uh, pretty fast. Great, thank, thank you very much. Next up, we have Romain, a Swiss private pilot fascinated by new technologies. He founded Usufly to unlock the aerial imagery potential within several industries, including architecture, engineering, and gaming. His achievements outside of business include uh, climbing Mont Blanc uh, within a day and fighting a at a white collar boxing event. Hello, hi everyone. I think I want to take a step back. Like before having a failure, what happened is that you, you take a risk. I think taking risks are is necessary to to grow a company fast. And sometimes you, when you take a risk, sometimes you win, sometimes you fail. And we have failed a lot of times, <laughs> but. I love failing because that's where you you learn the, the fastest. That's the steepest learning curve. And for example. Uh, we failed at uh, the third step of venture kick, which is a uh, 100k uh, fundraising. We I failed at securing a marketing intern candidate. At failed I failed at securing our biggest contract uh, for doing a 3D model like behind me of an entire country. But every of these failure provided us with um, strength. For example, as we had no fundings, I had to go back 100% in sales and we closed like um, 400K of revenue within the, the very first year, which means it's even better than having fundings. Then I failed at securing the marketing intern, but then I was able to have the best uh, candidate for the, the sales and business development manager. And finally, for the biggest con contract that we lost, that still made us able to improve our um, cloud architecture technology. And therefore, we are able to um, handle such big project and we'll be ready for the next uh, for the next opportunity. I want to take this occasion also to promote risk in personal life. It's yeah, just about getting outside of the comfort zone. That's where you learn the most. Thanks so much. And next up, we have Roy, co-creator of Tebo, the first community-led brand. He is also a founding partner of Come On e-commerce accelerator. Roy, what excites you about the future? Hey, Adam. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Briefly about us, um, Tebo. Um, at Tebo, we've made it our mission to truly empower the consumer in, in whatever we do. And now talking about the future, I'm really quite excited about what's to come, uh, mainly in three areas. And one is zeitgeist that we're in. Um, the second one is technology. And the third is uh, legislation, funnily enough. So and the first one, uh, it's zeitgeist or mindset as well. I think the, this collaboration mindset actually exists, uh, even though you know, if you just read through the newspapers and stuff, you might think it doesn't. And it, it's thriving. So um, when Alan, my co-founder, and I started off Tebow in 2017, as a, let's say, traditional direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. Um, at the start, at the time we were starting to sell um, men's underwear online, we very quickly got to a point, because we're not fashion designers, um, where we didn't know, you know how to develop and how to further improve our product. So we did what we thought was just natural, and we asked our consumers. So we had our first 5,000 email subscribers at the time, 
And, you know, we made this huge survey, 25 open questions, and we got over 2,000 replies in two days. So to us, this response rate uh, was extremely surprising and overwhelming. And it was really our aha moment that people and consumers nowadays really, you know, they want to have a say um, in whatever they buy and whatever they wear and what they drink. And they, they, in some countries, and especially the U.S. as well, which is our, help, uh, our, our main market, they expect to have a say. Think open source, decentralized organizations, which also help to have an extremely highly flexible and motivated workforce to work sp- super fast on specific sprints. Um, not only that, but also um, the loyalty rates and the repeat order rates are, are extremely much higher because they've been involved. We did a study with ETH that showed that they're three times higher. The other aspect was the technology, so the how. So think about technology that makes it possible to collaborate. Google Docs, that wasn't even there a few years ago. In that space, we've now um, developed our own software that allows for global collaboration in the um, product space, so consumer products, on as a pin to our e-commerce site. When we launched that, um, we got to over 12 minutes on average per average per time spent on the website per visitor. Um, the other thing is also that they just consume way more content and come back to your website without you having to pay for traffic. And the third component is a legal framework, um, the Swiss legal framework, which now allowed us to go a step further. Um, just in February, a new law came into place that now allows for um, security tokens to be actually secure and count as a share. So we were one of the very first companies to launch our security token and offer that to um, Swiss residents through our own website. So it's now um, tradable. You can buy and sell our shares digitally through our own website directly. And for us, this was just another big step in this um, consumer empowerment direction and mission. So that that's really something that truly excites me. We um, continue to raise funds through that token and grow um, and exceed the pace um, over the year. Thank you, Roy. Very good. Next up, we have uh, Kalman uh, from Personio. Kalman is a senior technical talent acquisition manager. And um, before we we begin, Kalman, can you tell me what Personio is? Absolutely. First of all, thank you, Adam, for having me. Uh, such a pleasure being able uh, to be here today. And uh, thank you guys for listening in. Um, I will make this quick. I'm not a salesperson, right? So um, my, my pitch will be will be really, really quick. Um, what is Pisonia is basically what we call it a people operating system for startups and small and medium sized enterprises and small and medium sized enterprises, what we consider companies from, I would say, five to 2,000 employees. So exactly the group of, uh, of companies what we're talking um, about here. What does Personias do in general, making your work with your employees much more efficient? And of course, it also goes beyond that. So it covers everything which is related to any kind of people in your company. It's a software as a service solution. So it's also very easy to handle from your web browser. We're completely hosted um, on the AWS cloud. So it's also quite fast. And I will just give you one uh, tiny example of also the way we are working with what we call people workflow automation. Let's imagine you're in a small company, you have a startup, you want to hire more people, you can easily go to the Pisonio system, you can choose a place like a job board, let's say, for example, Indeed or LinkedIn, where you want to post a position, you have an applicant tracking system as part of Pisonio, and then you start collecting the candidates. And then you have the candidates in the system, you process them, you say at one point, well, I would like to make an offer to the candidate, you can send the email right through the system, the candidate can do a digital signature with a digital signature function of Pisonio, you can hire the person and just with one click, you can add this person to the employee database. So another thing is also you have not the fear of losing any kind of data. This is a big, big factor because there are so many companies which are still working with Excel sheets, uh, actually in, in human resources. And this is also what we want to avoid. So this is just a very, very 
small snippet of what Pisonio can do. We have an own payroll solution as well. You can do time tracking. We have a mobile app as well. And it's all connected in one system. This is the huge, huge advantage we're having for Pisonio, but this is uh, all from it now. So um, Adam, I think you have a couple of Yes, I, I have a lot of questions and polls. Um, so Startup Network Europe is a startup. It's just me at the moment, but I'll be employing somebody next month. Who should my first hire be? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question there. I can tell you that um, I've been not with Personio since the very beginning, but already since three years. So I joined when we were 150 people. Uh, way to go for you still. Um, but what I can tell you is, in general, it might make sense to consider your opposing strengths, right? Um, to hire someone who loves to do things which you don't like to do so much. So, for example, uh, if you're not so much of a numbers person, but you're an excellent speaker, it might make sense to look into this as well to challenge you a bit there. And um, of course, you also need to then consider, right? You know, what what's kind of the area? What's the most important for you? Is it maybe finance and accounting? Is it admin work? Is it marketing? Because you're lacking there a bit, or even customer service or engineering, because maybe you have a brilliant idea, but you just don't have, you know, the experiences uh, being an engineer. And uh, so it always depends a bit there, of course. Great. And um, I suppose Steve Jobs, I was uh, watching a video of him and he said startups should try and get a great core group of people, maybe five or 10 great people when they begin. Uh, how do you think, uh, how important is that to hire well from the very beginning? Um, it's really, really important. I think it's always important to hire the right people, but especially in the beginning, if you just do one mishire, it can be having an extremely negative effect with what we call a toxic hire and talent acquisition. The bigger the company is, you know, um, the less the risk is for having toxic employees because you also have processes in place. But, you know, when you're a really small company, you have to be really cautious about that. And I can tell you that we at Personio, for example, taking this as an example, are in a really good situation. We, in the beginning, had four founders. Only one of them left because of personal reasons already in tier U, uh, sorry, in year two of um, our existence. And, um, for example, our seventh employee was Jonas. And Jonas is still with the company. He's now our CEO, also the person who's been building up our whole customer service uh, department. It's now consisting of more than 200 to 250 people alone. And there you can see what kind of positive impact it can now also have to bring in people early on. Again, the seventh employee, which then have like a significant um, impact and also carry the culture the company had in the very beginning, or at least, you know, the pieces which you can still carry through um, up until a certain moment in time. Yeah, very interesting. And when I'm looking for my new employee, where should I go? LinkedIn, uh, a jobs board? What would you normally do? Well, that depends a bit also on your budget. Um, we all know that, that LinkedIn is really, really expensive. Also, direct search you would need to have a license. There are pro licenses. There are these recruiter light licenses, which are not bad, but also don't give you the full pro experience. So the first way I would actually go, and this is also what our numbers and conversion rates are showing here at Pisonio internally, is to maybe go through referrals. Because um, maybe, you know, you have someone who knows someone who would be an excellent fit, or you can just reach out on LinkedIn, make a post, say, listen, guys, I'm looking for someone. Um, maybe you still have people from, I don't know, your university, from your previous job, which have been excellent co-workers. You could just simply have a coffee chat about because usually, you know, the people you're going well with uh, would be excellent choices for early on employers. Once your budget is a bit uh, bigger or you are willing to invest a bit more, it definitely makes sense to look um, into job boards. Um, now, we were mentioning uh, LinkedIn already. There are also job boards which are actually free of charge. Um, so Indeed was in the past, for example. There are several more um, which, uh, which are um, having good options there. Um, in general, it's worth also you know, direct searching. What, what I mean with this is actually approaching people proactively through, through LinkedIn because, of course, not everyone who's happy in their company will even do the effort and look on a job board uh, and apply to a role. So doing this um, extra my helps us here for example at Pisonio also a lot generate most of the highest through referrals and second of the highest actually through through direct search so the conversion rates and um, actually is what, what I mean are, are the highest there for referrals and then direct search is definitely uh, the way to go here yeah very interesting and uh, 
you're quite unique because Personio has gone from, it's six years old and it's gone from one or two employees to a thousand employees uh, very quickly. Um, how did you handle hypergrowth as a company? Yeah, that's a, that's indeed, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, I've been joining again when we were 150 people. I'm, I'm still a bit shocked that we've been just surpassing 1000 employees. So one of our key points was definitely that we had a good software in the beginning in place, which was indeed the Pezonio system, um, because we are what we call an engineer in dog feeding. Uh, so we are using our own solution. It definitely helped us from the beginning to have a certain structure around all of our processes, especially now from my perspective, the applicant tracking system and everything, which is related to that to have smooth processes. I would say most importantly, um, it, it's it's important to have a strong talent team. So even when I was not joining the company, and I was actually a Personio customer before, so that might be interesting. I've been implementing Personio as my previous company, which was indeed a smaller startup. I've been to a Personio event and uh, they were around like 50 to 60 people maybe back then. And I was shocked because I was coming from a company where we were three people in whole human resources, what we call the team, three people. And we were um, a team which was much bigger than Pezonio at the moment. Pezonio already had like six or seven people in human resources. So for me, it's really, really crucial to have these kind of resources because human resources is so often neglected in so many companies and it you know, just plays such an important role. So this is definitely one of the main strategies um, I would I would recommend in the beginning to invest early on in, in that team and not neglect it. And then of course, you know, there's all of the other teams which play together uh, as a well well working machine when it comes to marketing, when it comes to sales. And of course, there we also look again uh, into the core employees, which we've been hiring in the beginning, which hopefully also do a good job. They are referring the right people to the company. Yeah, and we, we did uh, three polls while you were speaking. Um, so one thing is remote working. Uh, everyone here, most people believe that startups are more efficient with remote working. And even post-pandemic, uh, they can see their employees mostly working remotely. You know, for me, I would say the same thing. I plan to hire somebody in Ireland. I plan to be with them face-to-face -face for maybe one or two months. And then we'll both go our own ways. But do you think that that's important, a mix of face-to-face -face and remote working? Or is it okay to do everything remote? This is a very tough question. I think there are different philosophies around this. Speaking for Pezonio, we've been doing a lot of polls as well uh, internally when we had to move into the remote situation. The good thing was we had a setup in place with Zoom and everything. And we, I would say, were generally a more remote friendly company. So it was not such a tough thing for us to do. However, when we were doing these polls and evaluating how happy people actually were working most almost completely except of some exceptional cases in in the remote um, um setup they were not so happy about this they wanted to come back to the office a huge majority of people said they felt the pezonio experience the company experience through direct interaction with people now of course pezonio has also been growing a lot right speaking for myself most of the people in my team are not located uh, in munich anymore we have huge set of people in Dell and acquisition located there were from tech most of the people are actually nowadays in Dublin or uh, sitting in Spain somewhere so I'm also used to that but still we are investing into quarterly team events so just to give you an example I'm going to fly over to Dublin to meet with a team in in December we also had a team dinner uh, with one of my employees joining us from Berlin just last week and so this face-to-face -face interaction at least for us is really really important to you know have sort of a healthy relationship and also to keep this healthy relationship with the employees and the bonding of course as well yeah and i actually worked for a company during the pandemic and um there would be new employees and after one or two months in the job maybe the job was challenging they didn't feel it was for them they left and they never moved from spain or whatever country they were in to where the company was based and I think if they had moved to the city I was staying in, maybe they would have gotten an apartment in that city. They would have gotten friends. They would have met all their uh, colleagues uh, face to face. And maybe there would have been more of a connection. Um, there's actually a poll I've just done here. And uh, biggest benefit of remote working, more productivity, decreased commutes. Um, but in terms of the challenges, uh, employee isolation is a big one. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you need to just take the decision for yourself. Are you able to hire the talent in your current location or do you maybe have to go for a hybrid approach? This is also possible. Like, for example, we realized hiring for engineering 
at the moment. It's really, really tough to get them, um, especially on the level we are looking for, because we're looking for really the absolute top notch of people. Now, for example, um, you know, previously we wanted to have them relocate to Munich. We've been just recently getting a bit more flexible um, about this also line, like a hybrid approach where we hire these people. They, for example, they would stay in Berlin, but they would come once a month to Munich to just be with the team. And then they will, you know, they will go back. We, of course, will pay all of the travels and um, also the accommodation but this is something which is working for us quite well to now also uh, go into this um, sort of hybrid approach and in general what we have been aligning on internally is a 50 percent remote um, general rule of which we are living so this is the way which we are dealing uh, with the whole situation at the moment great thank you and when you're in dublin um you know please message me i'll probably be here um very quickly uh, we we will finish now but just to share the um audience uh, poll reactions should companies post salaries in job adverts uh, 70 percent of you said they should um but it is a more complicated issue um, that's quite a viral topic on on linkedin nowadays um and also the other thing uh, that many of you wanted to know the answers for where who's involved in your recruitment process so 89% of people in this conference, they're mostly in small startups of one to 10 to 20 people. Uh, In-house is 89%, not a recruitment agency. In terms of uh, is your HR and recruitment strategy efficient? Uh, most people say yes, but not yes in a, in a strong, strong way. And um, then in terms of the hardest role to find the right person for, no surprise here, engineering followed by sales. Uh, Kalman, thank you very much for that. Our first speaker in this section will be uh, Franziska Steiner, Head of Entrepreneurship at Swissnex uh, San Francisco. Part of a worldwide network, Swissnex in San Francisco is Switzerland Innovation Outpost in the Bay Area. And Franziska, the question for you is, the importance of business net networks is undoubted. Um, as you see more Swiss startups in San Francisco fundraising and scaling internationally, what tips would you give to people at that early stage of their journey? Thank you very much, Adam. This is a fantastic question, and I think a really important one. And so I think business networks is one way to see it, but um, I would say just like building meaningful networks in general um, is actually the question. And I want to share some lessons learned from the Bay Area. So you already mentioned we are a global um, network. We have been around for 20 years, and we have years of experience connecting the dots between research, innovation, and the arts. Um, so I would say we have something um, of an experience in that question. So I want to share or structure that like other speakers as well did in those three, in that three way. So I want to share three takeaways of three success factors from 10 years of success stories um, with Swiss startups. So we have been supporting Swiss startups to internationalize for over 10 years and have thought really concretely about like the startups that we had like Ava or Dakuda or MindMaze and so on. So first, like obviously um, networks um, and you should have people or you should know people who know people. Um, and how do you build up those networks? I think a really key point is spending time in the area. So startups that have spent some time and moved like serious resources, like the CEO or CMO or whatever to the Bay Area or came repeatedly, they really um, built better networks. Then always have an offer and then ask, even for early stage startups, that's really something that you can have. You always have something to offer. And then also really important use others' replications. So you can use, for example, Swissnex, or you can use portfolio companies to get introductions to VCs. Really important. Next up, um, I would say skill set. You also need um, to build better and faster, especially if you're early stage startup and don't have time. So always ask, um, who else should I talk to? Be prepared um, because like you want to make sure that you use people's time uh, effectively and be fast, short and concise. Um, nobody has time to listen to you too long and to listen to too long explanations. But I think the third key success factor is actually the most important one, the mindset. So be set up for success. And here, especially in the Bay Area, it's really a different mindset. You have to think big and sell your vision. Don't talk about what you 
you know, can do right now or next year, really talk about how you will change the world. Then second, sharing culture. People are really open. They talk about their ideas. Don't think your idea is something precious that you should safeguard. Talk about it um, with as many people as possible. And then thirdly, be curious and open-minded because some of the most successful stories that we have experienced here at Swissnex actually came from really different angles um, that you wouldn't have thought of. And sometimes people don't look who they are, they um, like the importance that they carry. Um, and then, yeah, like you never know who you will meet and who people know. So be open, curious and talk about your idea. This so if you want to get in touch, yeah reach out to us. Thank you, Adam. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Roger, founder and CEO of Ambit Contra, uh, which manufactures and supplies equipment for humanitarian and disaster relief, as well as the private recreational sector. He has experience in peace support and humanitarian projects, working with the Swiss Armed Forces, the United Nations and NGOs globally. Now, Roger, we have a very specific question for you. Uh, when exporting products from Switzerland to the United States, what regulations should Swiss startups be aware of? Uh, yeah, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Yes, Adam. Um, I guess lately that's in all minds. You will see it uh, soon. Also, supply chain is a good topic lately, thanks to the evergreen getting stuck in the Suez Canal or everybody have a short supply chain delay these days. So startups in Switzerland, it's really important to see one thing. We rely heavily on the established supply chain you right now, which is great. Switzerland has some great freight companies. Some of the largest are actually headquartered in Switzerland. So we rely there strongly that everything will work and everything will go, especially when trading with goods, uh, but also um, the intellectual uh, properties like digital uh, should not be forgotten there. Now, America is a special market to import. So you should always be aware of the trade compliance here. As I said, besides the usual delays, America with the OFAC, which is the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is basically your export control uh, center here, uh, the customs are really special too. And as well, I saw a lot of these um, the participants or also the, the people attending are in the medical and the pharmaceutical sector, and they all know the FDA. So before basically starting your startup, uh, and having this great idea of whatever you want to export from Switzerland to America, it is really crucial for a startup to have the right supply chain management uh, partner. It could be a freight company that is located on both sides of the Atlantic or just someone with knowledge of the export laws in Switzerland. You don't want to run into something later when your goods are already away. Uh, which could basically crumble down your whole idea of exporting something great from Switzerland when it can't enter the United States market. So it's just the takeaways. Be aware of your supply chain to pick your partners. Don't ever forget the trade compliance. Uh, it's boring, but it's all out there. You can just read it all. It's not, it's not rocket science. And to work on your network. And just as a thing, I think, for every startup in America, it's called the Swiss Global Enterprise. It's uh, basically an NGO from the Swiss government. If you deal abroad, check out the website. They're a great help for any startup worldwide, not just in America, uh, for a Swiss startup to start the business abroad. Roger, Thanks. thank you for your very practical advice. Next up, we will have Kareen, a CMO of Swiss Business Hub USA, um, which is affiliated with the Swiss Embassy. The Swiss Business Hub USA represents Switzerland Global Enterprise in the United States and works all over the world to support entrepreneurs and promote Switzerland as a business location. Uh, Kareen has spent most of her career leading marketing initiatives for CPG brands and startups. Hi, everybody. Thank you, uh, Adam challenges. I uh, would start by saying the US market can be um, exceptionally attractive and but at the same time um, overwhelming. So I would recommend first to um, do your homework, um, do extensive research to assess your market size, your competition, who is your who is in your industry, 
uh, how much money um, they've raised, um, who the customers are, and know the, pr know the pricing strategy. Uh, expanding into the U.S. market takes a lot of research, um, support, and careful planning. Uh, what I've seen a common mistake uh, many firms make when they begin operations in the U.S. is to look at it as one, one market. And um, I would recommend instead start looking at where the clusters um, for your particular sector are, what are the opportunities in the market, target the specific industries and customers, make sure you have a defined geographical focus because when you invest in the United States, it's definitely not cheap, right? So you want to make sure that you are really doing your due diligence. Another point um, is that cultural differences are very important to keep in mind. Um, it matters that you are being present, that you are spending time in the U.S., I would recommend show your commitment to your customers, your investors, build your network, um, reach out to advisors, being able to have face-to-face uh, -face interactions, uh, make it much more easier to build relationships and obtain a trust of confidence. And um, finally, make sure you have an actual plan, like the budget and resources set for the long term. Make sure your business is ready for the expansion into North America by assessing your company's standing and goals. Um, expanding and moving your business to a new country is a big step. And uh, I cannot insist by make sure you are prepared both financially and uh, as well mentally. And reach out to Switzerland Global Enterprise. We are here and uh, the Swiss Business Hub to support you. Thank Karen, you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have uh, Ralph, founder and CEO of AW8 Global Business Builders, uh, which empowers founders and business owners to create <clears throat> compound value and deliver the full potential of their enterprise. He has held several board and C-level positions throughout the years. And Ralph, you've met some seriously ambitious companies and founders during your career. Uh, what certain skill uh, sets have you seen among them? Yes, yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Uh, great to be here. And hello, everyone. Uh, just like many, I came to the US with a tech company, in my case, Google, actually from Hong Kong, and I lived in the UK and Germany before, and I also actually did my master's in St. Gall in Switzerland. Uh, I launched AW8 Global Business Builders to empower growth companies by providing the CovQSAS value creation platform. And to get straight to your question, yes, for sure. First of all, the vast majority of founding teams don't really deliver the full potential of their enterprise. So the question is spot on, what is it that sets the winners apart? For sure, there's no secret source for a successful US expansion or generally growth plan. First though, those who succeed have a clear understanding of their status quo. They know what it is going on and what they need to do and are not too shy to ask. Secondly, they define their priorities and only then they define their focus. They have a plan and focus only on the strategic initiatives that really matter, which is easier said than done, especially in fast moving tech where there's so much that you could do all the time. If they have in one way or another frameworks, methods and software tools for value creation in place, this becomes much, much easier. If any of you don't have this, you better implement such quickly. As a result of leveraging best practices, they don't get sidetracked easily and they don't jump on every single opportunity outside the very, very core. So keep in mind in scale up land, less is most often much more and focus wins. To conclude, you need to assess the IQ of your company, use smart tools for strategy execution and learn and evolve on an ongoing basis. It's all about execution and compounding strategies at the end. This all together will do the trick. And if I may summarize the single steps, you start with an assessment, you have to create alignment, transparency, priorities, then setting the focus, develop the strategy, track and report on all of those. Then you have to assess it again and start the process and continue to involve. Thank you very much for having me, Adam. Uh, please have the audience reach out if any questions and congrats for hosting such a great event.
Mershad, uh, founder and chairman of Octave and CEO of Mictic. He has experience as a founder, consultant, operator, and advisor to private startups. And our question for you, Mershad, is what tips do you have for driving a brand into the US and other markets? This is Mershad, CEO of Mictic. I'm originally from the States, but now residing in Zurich since accepting uh, the role with Mictic. Hop on. So I'm going to assume that the case is a mass market opportunity. For now, let's assume there's already been a proof of concept, demand, traction, etc. The main thing about the U.S., and I suppose I have a little bit of a pass to say this because I'm from there, but the U.S. consumers are extremely spoiled. It's incredibly service oriented. We just we have the highest expectations, mainly because we know we have options. So when somebody inquires about your service or you know products, you should really anticipate or expect that they're essentially cutting and pasting that same email to probably five competitors. And unfortunately, even though it's not the best gauge, generally sometimes a response time equates to the quality of, of, of that particular or respective company, right? So, you know, for example, we always had a policy where we would respond to inquiries within four hours or less during business hours, uh, weekends, 12 hours or less. Um, no exceptions because we wanted to make sure that we were there. The culture is extremely customer centric. So ultimately, I would say that you you just want to make sure that you have the resources and support and really ideally someone who is regionally based, who understands, you know, the the business etiquette and the culture. Uh, Otherwise you can, it's obviously an attractive market. It's, it's, it's huge depending on your, you know, vertical or your, your industry. Uh, there's obviously a lot of benefits, but if you don't have those things in place, you can sink. You can sink quite fast uh, because they're hop on bad reviews, comments, and so forth. So I would highly advise any Swiss organization that wants to cross there. You just want to just make sure you check the boxes, speak with you know individuals. I'm happy to, you guys can reach out to me. Anybody that's interested to give you my two cents is just one opinion, but I think it would be helpful. But uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you. That that was really useful advice, actually, in just two minutes. So I appreciate that. Next up, we have Alison, Executive Vice President of Cybera. Uh, Alison has a track record of strategic planning, sales development, risk mitigation, and client relationship management in both the corporate banking and innovative startup sector world. Um, and Alison, you're originally from the United States. So could you tell us about the biggest differences uh, between the areas of payroll, accounting, and tax uh, between the United States and Switzerland? Sure. Thanks, Adam. Thanks very much for uh, hosting. I'm, res- I'm representing Cybera, and I just wanted to um, compliment your logistical and organizational skills. This is an amazing conference. Um, so Cybera, just very quickly, we are developing anti-scam and anti-fraud products that help financial institutions react to and prevent online financial cybercrimes. And as, as you said, Adam, I am American, but now living in Switzerland, so I have experience in both markets. And when it comes to payroll, accounting, and tax, um, my advice is that's not the fun stuff of building a company, certainly. I think that everybody's really excited to build their product, grow their market, um, meet with their customers, raise funding, and tax and payroll and accounting is the boring stuff. Um, But my advice would be that there are really big differences between how things work in Switzerland and how things work in the U.S., and particularly that there are big differences between each state in the U.S. So, for example... Health insurance is always done privately um, in Switzerland, but it's a big mishmash of corporate sponsored plans and government sponsored plans and requirements from the states and from the federal government in terms of what you have to have. Making mistakes can lead to huge financial penalties. So for example, if you don't have the right kind of disability and paid family leave insurance in the state of New York, for example, um, your company will be fined $2,000 every 10 days that you don't have the coverage in place. So while certainly having the right insurance is not a fun thing to have to think about, not having it uh, can be very costly. And so my my advice is to um, seek out really high quality providers in those areas, payroll, accounting, and tax, to make sure you're getting the best possible advice and that it is worth um, the investment in making those paying the, for those services, even though, like I said, that's not the fun stuff of building a company. Alison, thank you so much. And I'm the same. I hate numbers, but I have to have an accountant and uh, hire people because it's essential.
So our next speaker will be uh, Tanya. She is CEO of SICTIC, the Swiss ICT Investor Club. And before joining SICTIC, uh, Tanya spent 15 years in investment banking with a niche focus in tech M&A. And now she is focusing on the early phase of the tech life cycle. Uh, SICTIC is a nonprofit organization focused on supporting and connecting Swiss tech startups and investors. And Tanya, you have uh, 20 minutes now. Um, you mentioned that SICTIC uh, closed 80 funding rounds uh, last year uh, in our conversation we had, which is a very impressive number considering the uh, pandemic. Um, so as a biz business angel network, um, how did you navigate and engage the network while facilita facilitating deals during this time? Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, this is a great question. I think, you know, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of the speakers have already kind of touched on this a bit. I think, you know, so the, the pandemic's been bo both kind of a blessing and a curse. I think there's some good things that have come out of it. Um, one thing is, I think people are a lot more open to digitalizing and, and, and going online. So even you look at, you know, a country like Switzerland, I mean, even a few years ago, if you said, yeah, let, why don't you attend my online event? There would be quite a significant, it would be quite difficult to get a really large gathering. But I think that as you have proved today, Adam, there's a, quite a few people who have joined us online. And I think that's the underlying key of this is it's really created opportunity and people are open to this idea of there's more than just one way to connect. I think um, as a business angel network, it's always the underlying value is, is to be able to meet in person and, you know, um, and, and make deals happen. Uh, but we have taken as soon, you know, last year when the whole pandemic hit, we, we very quickly within three weeks converted our events to online events. And as things have opened up, um, starting in September, we've we've taken a strategy of a hybrid strategy of doing all, you know, giving our audience like a choice. So either, you know, coming in person or, or doing an online event. So, yeah. So a little bit about um, SICTIC. So we are Switzerland's largest and most active business angel network. And um, I joined SICTIC here in May, and I'm really excited to, to be part of this. Um, we ourselves are a nonprofit organization, and we have about 152 companies in our portfolio. Uh, we screen about 200 a year, 200 startups. And last year, even in a pandemic year, uh, we had 80 investment rounds, and those were all facilitated through our, you know, SICTIC uh, investors from our business angel network. So, you know, as you know, I mean, I... Switzerland's a great an economy. And, you know, if you think about pharmaceutical, you're going to think of companies like Roche and Novartis and based out of Basel. If you think about banking, you're going to, you're going to think about UBS. You're going to think about Credit Suisse. If you think about mechanical engineering, you're going to think about ABB. And, you know, what's really important as well is technology, um, specifically ICT. There's quite a few universities here, top universities with leading tech and science programs. So like ETH in Zurich or EPFL in Lausanne that are really supporting this as well. And then luxury goods. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you could, uh, a lot of people probably think right away about watches. So, you know, Rolex, Patek Philip. If you've been to a recent James Bond film, maybe you want to get a hold of a, a nice Omega. <laughs> Yeah, so so there's quite a few things, but I mean, we are more than just watches or great, you know, or or delicious chocolatiers. Um, one of the main drivers, I think, of the Swiss economy um, is innovation. So Switzerland's actually ranked number one most innovative country in the world for the tenth year in a row, and this is by the World Inter Intellectual Property Organization. Um, which is WIPO. And for those of you who are interested in the other rankings there, I have them on the side. Switzerland one, uh, Sweden comes in second, USA third, UK fourth, Republic of Korea fifth, Netherlands sixth, Finland seventh, Singapore eighth, Denmark ninth, and Germany 10th. So really Switzerland is a haven for investment and, and innovation. And we really score highly in market sophistication and tech output. I mean, and you, you, it, it makes a lot of sense considering our population. You know, we only have, we're only home to 8.6 million people. So we really have to make sure that innovation really is the driver of our economy. 
And so really, I want to just touch on, you know, well, for those of you who may be now thinking about investing um, in, in uh, Swiss startups, why? So I think there's a few, you know, key, key points here. Before I get into that, I'd like to share with you kind of our Swiss tech startup ecosystem map that we've created. What's really interesting here is we, um, you know, the tech startup ecosystem, there's over 200 organizations here in Switzerland who support uh, startups. So either they're they're either free or they're subsidized, and the supports really kind of break it, broken up into eight main you know sections. So either they're supporting startups through this co working and training programs, or through the science and teaching and transferring, or through events and networking, information platforms and associations. There's incubators and accelerators. Then you have your investors, and then you have all these kinds of awards and support um, programs as well as you know, consulting and coaching. And I'm happy to share this map and, and the presentation with anybody afterwards who's interested in looking at this in more detail. Another reason why you would want to invest in Swiss startups is really um, the underlying quality of the Swiss startups. So we really, you know, this is an interesting case study done by ETH. Um, so Swiss startups have a really high success rate. So uh, they did a case study from 1973 to 218, 429 um, spinoffs out of, out of ETH. And of that, 92.9% had a five-year survival rate, which is, which is phenomenal. They created over, you know, 4.8 billion in equity value. You know, there was 3.6x money multiple there. Of those, you know, 41 exits, yeah, so really, it's really about quality, not just volume. Another important thing is if you look at this here, so this is some information from 2012 to 2020. So total invested capital in Swiss startups in 2020 was 2.1 billion. So it took a slight dive from 219. Uh, but, you know, it's really the volume has, has grown really fivefold. Um, and it's interesting, the number of finance rounds as well, that's also up. So, you know, 304 financing rounds in 2020. And we continue to see this trend of, of, uh, of it growing. And then here's an interesting breakdown of the capital, invested capital by sector. So if you look at this, of course, a majority, you know, 820 million is comprised of biotech deals, but you see, you know, whopping 500 um, million in ICT and then another 220 uh, million in ICT specifically for fintech. So, so uh, it's quite, uh, quite an interesting um, breakdown. And then you see here um, from 212 to 2020, medtech is up 199 percent. And when you look at the financing rounds by sector, so the, the number of rounds um, by sector, you'll see that actually number-wise, ICT is leading, so with 119 rounds, um, followed by biotech with 42, and then ICT fintech specifically, 38, 33 medtech, 23 nano, and it breaks down. Um, interestingly enough as well, a uh, 69% increase in clean tech deals. So we see a, a jump in that, in that area, in that sector. Um, so we kind of looked at that from a macro perspective, just looking at a micro perspective at our own portfolio. Um, this is, here's some selected deals. So we have 152 startups in our portfolio. It is a um, one that's a unicorn, Farmy, Frontify. A lot of you may know a lot of these names, Carbon Delta, which was acquired by um, MSCI and um, quite a few other good names here, Beekeeper. Within our community ourselves, so at the end of December last year, we had 427 angel investors and um, we did 80 tech startup investment rounds. We closed 80. That made up about 54% of the early stage ICT, so tech market. And if you look at that breakdown in terms of sector, again, you'll see 21% of that fell into the fintech category, almost 17% in other ICT, another 8% in hardware tech, 6% in communication, and another 6% in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and a good whopping, you know, almost 75% of those startups have a B2B focus. 
And this, this is our data from last year, from 2020. So as I mentioned, you know, SIGTIC, we are nonprofit. And what we're, our mission really is, is to create a platform where we can connect the most innovative, you know, the best, you know, Swiss start, you know, uh, startups together with smart money investors. And when we say smart money, we're really focused on building a, an investor community where the investors bring uh, so much more than just money. So they're really also bringing their domain expertise, their knowledge, um, they're sharing their network, things like this that can really help shape and, and, and support a startup so that they can grow and become successful here. Um, just a little bit about um, us. So if anybody's interested, I mean, we are together with our partners, we, we and a number of our, you know, uh, board, all, all of the people on our board, uh, all 11 um, board members work for us for pro bono. And um, a lot of people have dedicated great deals of time to create this Swiss Angel Investor Handbook, which is basically a book with best practices on how to invest in Swiss early stage tech startups. And it covers a range of things like tax um, issues, how things may differ uh, here in Switzerland when you're investing. Um, 258 pages, completely free. Um, so, you know, if you're interested, please go to our website, sicktick.ch, uh, and, you know, just request a copy. And a little bit, and in addition to the Swiss handbook, we also have a very interesting investment report. And we, we produce these every year at the end of the year and share um, interesting uh, data on what the tech, the, the Swiss tech startup, you know, landscape looks like. So, you know, feel free to check out our website and, and download a free copy as well. And again, if anybody here, you know, whether you're an angel investor or you're a startup looking for funding, you know, feel free to come to our website, take a look at that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Adam. And I want to say thank you to everyone as well for, for being here on this event tonight.